Okay, we will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Moira Swanson. I am joined by Josh Weesey from the um, Crane Trust. And today we are here to talk about bison and conservation and management practices. Um, a little bit about Conservation Nebraska. We are part of the Common Ground Program and we work to strengthen communities' understanding of air, water, and soils through education. Um, with that, let's get started and I will pass things off to Josh. Well, thanks, Moira. Um, my name is Josh Wiesti, and uh, I'm the range manager at the Crane Trust. Um, a little bit of background about myself uh, while I get my screen up. Um, as a range manager, my large part of my job is um, involved in the long-term biological monitoring program at the Crane Trust. Um, so I do a lot of work with the vegetation um, and looking at uh, long-term changes to our habitat and vegetation over time um, and across varying management regimes. And that really kind of got my interest started with bison. Um, I started the Crane Trust in 2015, just a few months after the Crane Trust <coughs> introduced their first uh, bison back to the property. So um, 150 years of of a landscape devoid of the native grazer on the land um, and bringing him back. Um, it was pretty exciting to uh, be a part of and to start to see some of the changes that have happened. So um, bison went from a number of about 30 to 60 million um, bison on the Great Plains um, at the turn of the 1700s to 1800s um, and very very quickly by about 1870 to 1880 those um, bison herds were reduced to just a few hundred um, and as you can see on the image on the left uh, kind of how quickly those bison herds were reduced and then you know, kind of their historic range and how quickly that range was just reduced to, to a few isolated herds. Um, over time, uh, or during this time, a few key individuals recognized that bison uh, were, you know, a disappearing species and, and they were saved. Um, as, re as a result of that, those uh, few species or few uh, individuals that were saved uh, wound up in these isolated groups in our national, some of our national parks. And from there, all of our bison genetics kind of originated. So they went through this huge bottlenecking um, period. With the loss of bison as a native grazer, grasslands start to lose um, their functionality. So grasslands essentially are a function of drought, fire, and grazing all act upon a acting upon each other um, to produce a system um, that's uh, adapted to these uh, three disturbance pressures uh, that the system is grasslands and um, the wide breadth of biodiversity that they um, that they hold. Um, so we start to lose these bison and we start to lose these intricate uh, relationships that they have with the landscape and with all the animals that evolved with them. Um, a little bit about the Crane Trust. Um, we are a nonprofit that is dedicated to protecting and maintaining uh, the habitat for whooping cranes, sandhill cranes, and other migratory bird species. We're located in South Central Hall County, right along the Platte River. Um, and our mission is about an 80 mile stretch of river um, called the Big Bend of the Platte River. And that is the primary whooping crane and sandhill crane corridor through the central portion of the state. <coughs> And we also exist in a landscape that is representative of several different habitat types um, in the state. So we have some sand, sand hills and mixed grass prairie components. We have tall grass prairie components, largely sub irrigated um, uh, areas that support a tall grass prairie. We have wet meadow and we have a little bit of woodland and of course riverine habitats. So really we have a wide representation of different habitat types and a really an ideal place to begin to understand how bison may have affected um, or influenced these different habitats across the state. So uh, why do 
uh, why does a crane organization care about bison and why did we decide to bring um, bison back? Well, if you can look at the uh, map there, uh, the crane trust again, as I mentioned, is right in the center of the whooping crane, uh, which is the yellow bar and the sandhill crane, which is the orange bar migratory corridor. Well, that polygon that's in purple represents the bison historic range. Um, and as you can see, uh, bison had, uh, bison's range extended nearly in the entirety of the whooping crane corridor. And most um, over two thirds of the sandhill crane migratory corridor, including areas of their uh, breeding and nesting habitat and their wintering grounds. <clears throat> and there on the left, you can see uh, two sandhill cranes that are actually in what's called a bison wallow. And I'll talk about wallows here a little bit more. But essentially, uh, one year after we introduced bison, sandhill cranes began to find these bison wallows and began to peck their um, began to peck down and find uh, food resources in them. So just kind of uh, one subtle way that we kind of are beginning to unravel uh, the importance of bison um, and particularly to cranes. <clears throat> so we uh, developed a vision statement for our bison and we knew that not only did we want to restore bison's natural function on the landscape, but we also wanted to uh, contribute to some of the greater conservation efforts um, and concerns of bison, including their genetic recovery, um, their ecological recovery, and their cultural recovery um, throughout North America. So kind of our main goals with our herd um, have been to one, improve ecosystem structure and function. Two, uh, support the genetic recovery of bison in North America. Um, three, maintain the well being of our bison and their health with limited human in intervention um, and support the wildness of that species um, to again bring them back as uh, wildlife and not as livestock. Uh, goal four, improve our outreach and education efforts using bison as a platform. And then number five is to develop some strategies for our long-term economic stability um, and sustainability of our bison herd. Um, I'll talk quite a bit about goals one through four today. Goal five um, was a little more internal um, and probably less, uh, less relatable for you guys tonight. So the Crane Trust Bison Range is about 1,100 acres of our 6,000 deeded acres that the Crane Trust owns. Um, when we help manage another 4,000 acres on top of that. Uh, but essentially we can break those bison ranges down into um, kind of an upland area, um, a lowland area. Um, so we have kind of tall and mixed grass prairie and low wet meadow mixed with tall grass prairie. Um, and essentially we really wanted to look at how can we best manage these kind of larger vegetation units um, using our bison. <clears throat> We knew kind of coming into this that our herd is kind of restricted in our ability to both manage for bison biodiversity and to manage for the recovery of the species. Um, and, you know, these uh, challenges are not um, unique to the Crane Trust, uh, particularly things like size of management units. A lot of bison herds are limited um, in the amount of area that the bison are able to freely roam, um, especially in a place like Nebraska where we, own, we have a lot of private land. Um, it's really hard to uh, get large tracts of land to restore bison to. Uh, habitat fragmentation, another one that's uh, really common in Nebraska where we don't have these tracks. Not only are they small tracks, but they're small tracks that are broken up into many pieces. Uh, things like lack of big predators, lack of things like mountain lions, wolves, and even grizzly bears in, um, in this area anymore um, is another big hurdle kind of working against the natural selection ability of bison. <clears throat> but we have a lot of good things working for us at the Crane Trust too. We have um, natural patterns or verbivory, so we try to move bison around with um, a, few, a few key strategies to help uh, implement their uh, grazing patterns across the landscape. Then we also have um, a soil and vegetation management program that helps us track these changes over time. So really um, working towards our ability to benefit um, bison and the the greater biodiversity of grasslands with the use of bison. 
Um, not going to talk about this too much, but essentially we can contribute to some key areas as a small organization to bison recovery as a species, specifically looking at the genetic and diversity. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our genetic diversity program tonight. But I did I mention that bison were isolated in these small conservation pop populations and um, they began to interbreeding and the genetics essentially started to bottleneck with that. So part of what we're doing here is, is um, reincorporating those genetics and producing uh, really, really diverse calves that hopefully will be ready to take on things like climate change and disease into the future. Um, we are also represented right in the heart of bison country. So according to some historic accounts of bison in Hall, Hall County area or along the Platte River, there would be periods of time where bison would travel and cross for days. Um, um, large herds would cross and take days to cross certain areas so um, pioneers, travelers, and explorers could continue um, their movements westward. Um, and then we have uh, several factors of, again, natural selection acting upon our bison, um, including uh, uh, a health program that's kind of geared towards a resilient species rather than the most healthy um, individuals. And I'll talk a little bit about that here in a bit. Um, so, you know, from those uh, key management areas, both the uplands and the lowland areas where we have our bison grazing, we really had some key management uh, tactics and key management objectives that we wanted to, um, and that we're still working to achieve. Um, some of these are things that plague grasslands as a whole, including invasive species, woody species encroachment, um, and things of that nature, um, and also things like reduced native floral diversity. So how can we manage our bison to improve native floral diversity? And, and a lot of that, again, goes back to their movements. Um, we also identified some key species of concern that ex exist within those management units. Um, and we really want to uh, use these species as uh, essentially benchmark species letting us know that we're doing or working in the favor of wildlife as a whole. And each of these species, as you can see on the all the way to the right, have different levels of um, grassland structure to which they prefer. Some prefer short, stress, short stature grass, some prefer tall stature grass, and some prefer intermediate levels of grazing. Um, and I will kind of get to that as we go, um, discussing how bison are kind of offering that um, as opposed to what the cattle may be offering. Um, so we do graze bison and cattle on our landscape, and each of them have different um, management applications depending on what your goals are. Um, so essentially, we do a lot of work, uh, like I had mentioned, tracking these habitat changes over time. And this just kind of shows you the setup of what uh, a long-term monitoring plot looks like on our property. Um, we do these vegetation surveys across a 100-meter transect, and then we have 64 monitoring plots uh, throughout our property that we do these surveys on. And essentially, we're estimating not only diversity and the cover of the different diversity type and species types that exist on that property, but also um, estimating their stature and their habitat structure um, to get an idea to start building models around um, what species of concern are preferring and what bison are kind of doing to the landscape. Um, <clears throat> we're also tracking the transition from of grazing with cattle to grazing with bison. And here um, you can kind of see uh, on the picture on the left is kind of the last year that bison or that cattle were allowed to graze this pasture. Um, and as you can see, they don't leave a lot of standing vegetation when they when they're grazing, um, kind of uh, grazing everything in a really uniform pattern. And the image on the right is the first year after bison had been reintroduced to the to the property and you can see that they are leaving a lot more standing biomass and you can see a healthy response to the forb population so you can see quite a few forbs blooming um, in this image so these images were taken right around a year apart from each other um, so about the same time of year to about late summer so kind of give you an idea and context of um, you know the some of the some of the visual um, changes that we're already starting to see with bison um, as we transition from cattle grazing in certain areas. 
Um, another thing that I had mentioned is uh, bison do uh, what's called wallowing. So that's essentially a behavior that bison um, do in which they roll around in the dirt to cover themselves with dirt. Um, it helps to eliminate some insect predation on them. It also helps to uh, cool them off and it helps in shedding processes and is also so sort of a behavioral thing to kind of show dominance and aggression. Um, so it, bison will roll around in the dirt and essentially start to create these bowl-like depressions. And one of the kind of interesting questions that we had um, after reintroducing the bison and starting to see these wallows start to form really, really quickly after their reintroduction is, well, is that going to invite invasive species into the system? Um, and so what we did is we set up a small study looking at um, the uh, percentages of invasive versus um, native species that are inside and outside of these wallows. And what we really found is that the percentages, so say if we had a, a two to one uh, ratio of native to exotic species, those that ratio stayed the same both inside and outside those wallows. Um, one of the really cool things that we found is that some species, um, some plant species actually started to uh, show up within the wallows and on the edges of those wallows that we didn't see anywhere else on the property. Um, what that kind of led us to, to start to think about is that a lot of these species have been waiting in the soil bank for, you know, close to 150 years, if that's how long bison have been away from the system, um, waiting for some sort of disturbance like what bison are offering with wallowing. So kind of a total vegetation removal um, before they are allowed to germinate again. So really, we're already starting to see that vegetation response, even in these micro sites um, of bison wallows. Um, so bison have a strong interaction between grazing and fire. Um, so bison really like to graze in areas that have been recently burned. It gives them fresh green growth that is high in nutrients for them to come graze on. There's less competition for their eyes um, and risk to getting poked in the face. So they really like to graze in these areas that are you know, shorten vegetation. Um, and we can use that to our advantage. Um, one of the goals of grassland management is to manage for a mosaic of different habitat types. So again, short, tall, and intermediate grass structure. And we can encourage bison movement, not only through fire, but we can do it through haying as well. And we've been implementing that and testing that theory out at the crane trust. So how well we can move bison around, how well we can distribute their disturbance effect on the grassland system. Um, we've done a lot of work in removing interior fences, so that's um, creating larger and larger pastures um, to allow more free movement of our bison. So that's kind of giving them a little more free choice um, in their movements and what they're grazing, and hopefully that will have a long-term effect um, as we continue to study it. Um, but we do face these kind of uh, uh, common challenges of grasslands and, and woody species encroachment and invasive species. So, you know, our goal of one day at the Crane Trust would be to allow the bison to freely move throughout the entire property. However, until we can get a handle on some of the invasive species issues and woody species issues, they're kind of limiting factors for us and to reaching those sort of goals. Um, I want to remind everybody if they do have questions throughout this to go ahead and um, type them into the chat and then kind of as we get to the end of the talk, um, I'll go back over and, and we'll review those questions and I'll do my best to answer those for you. Um, one other thing that we, uh, or our second goal is that we wanted to support and contribute to the genetic recovery of bison. Again, help diversify their genetics from this bottleneck state and from their isolated groups. And so um, really the idea is that we can bring in bison from known herds of origin um, that we know that our um, bison are not representing. So essentially, where are these bison coming from? Which national park or national herd are they coming from that's not well represented within our herd already? And so the strategy, um, if we look at that, we can kind of look at these herds um, that are known throughout um, kind of the big national herds, Teddy Roosevelt, National Bison Range, Fort Niobrara, Tallgrass Prairie, Yellowstone, and we can start to see um, areas where our genetic material essentially is lacking um, from those original 
uh, federal core herds. And so what we've done over time is essentially um, introduced um, new bulls, young bulls, to um, freely move up into the hier hierarchy and social system um, that will eventually become breeders and help us produce genetically diverse calves. Um, and then you can look at that uh, graph or image on the right, and that kind of shows our progress. Um, so we've, you know, uh, compared to uh, conservation herds as a whole. So the the black bars on top represent the upper end of heterozygosity or diversity um, in, uh, in national herds and conservation herds. And then the lower black bar represents kind of the lower end of that. And we're really kind of right up there with some of the, um, some of the uh, largest conservation herds as far as our genetic diversity goes. So we kind of see those gains. Um, we do see some sort of flatlining effect now, but we've recently purchased some more bison from Fort Niobrara. Um, so hopefully as those begin to become of breeding age, we start to see that diversity start to climb again. And that's our goal um, as we move forward with our genetic diversity program. And the idea is that we produce genetically diverse calves that we can then use to help other conservation herds start um, their bison programs. Again, this just kind of uh, demonstrates that, uh, oops, the, uh, uh, that sort of goal of ours. So essentially it's the same graph you saw before, just with uh, different levels of confidence um, in there. And then essentially, again, what we're doing is bringing in bulls from herds that we know we're missing genetics from. We're keeping um, our most genetically uh, diverse heifers, so our female calves, um, and hopefully in that way we're going to conserve our genetic diversity while still introducing new genetic diversity. Um, and then again, uh, distributing those calves to places that are, you know, they're their goal is to use bison um, to uh, produce more bison. So really looking for um, people that are looking to start their own conservation herds and not have a destiny of a feedlot or a slaughterhouse. Um, goal three had a lot to do with maintaining the bison health. And um, one of the things we really wanted to do was um, not have a, a lot of human inputs again so that natural selection is acting in a natural way on our bison so that they are ready and prepared to take on genetic diseases and challenges of things like climate change into the future but we did identify a few key um, uh, diseases that may threaten our bison particularly in central nebraska and you can kind of see these listed here um, but what we found is that um, there's a lot of things that go into whether or not bison herds are going to exhibit any sort of disease or become an infectious herd where they're um, spreading disease. A lot of it has to go. To, a lot of it has to go to stocking management. Um, so that's essentially how tightly we're packing bison into certain areas, giving them a lot of room to roam so that they have less uh, contact with one another or chance to pick up disease or wait or less ability to move away from disease. Um, another one is really focusing on their biosecurity. So that is kind of knowing what the bison may be coming into the crane trust with um, or uh, mitigating any diseases before we introduce um, that disease or those new bison with that disease to our herd. Um, Minimizing stress. So I'll talk about a little bit more about that, but stress is really closely related to um, bison health. And um, again, I'll talk about a bit more about that. We want to make sure to offer them minerals and treatments if absolutely necessary. So again, kind of uh, looking at uh, keeping our hands off if we can, but we do recognize that bison, again, are on a limited space and they can't freely move to some of the places that they may have historically moved to, things like salt licks, um, where we know bison would have frequently used, but there's no places to lick salt on the property. So we do offer something like a salt block, which also helps mitigate things like hoof rot, um, one of the key diseases we're concerned about. And we do several health uh, monitoring um, uh, processes, uh, especially during our working period. Um, we look at body condition. We do a lot of record keeping. We look at their parasites. 
Um, we uh, look at we can look at their mineral content if we have any that die, and then we again we do necropsy um, if we have any that pass away to kind of get a better idea of um, if we have an infectious disease to be concerned about, or if that may animal may have died of natural causes. So um, at the Crane Trust and across to the board at, at many um, bison management facilities, uh, we, we've been implementing what's called low stress bison handling. And essentially that is um, as a way to keep bison calm um, during times when we have to handle the bison or work the bison or, or get information off the bison. Um, and this is uh, mitigates uh, risk to both the bison and humans. Um, what winds up happening is as we're working bison, if they get stressed out, it can kickstart certain diseases, diseases like mycoplasma, which is an emerging disease with bison. Um, stress has been directly tied to um, the representation of that disease in certain herds. But we can, um, as we reduce stress, what we find is that working with the bison becomes a faster process. And the faster that process is, um, the less risk that, um, that we have to, uh, that we have while handling these bison. And um, the quicker the quicker the process is, the, the less time they have to get actually get stressed out. So if it's quick for them, they have less time in the cages um, and the lock system to get stressed out. Um, just to kind of give you a look at what bison working facilities look like. Um, so we have a sorting and a catch area. These are the areas that are kind of the highest stress because they're the smallest enclosed area for these bison. But we essentially use these systems of rolling locks to move bison up through our system to a working area where handlers can handle them safely. Um, when you do come to, um, when you are at a bison working, bison working should be very quiet and humans should do their best to stay out of sight and really use the animal's fighter, or sorry, flight instincts. So using um, things called or what they call pressure and release. So that's approaching a bison um, on its pressure side where it wants to move away from you, but not doing that for too long and giving them the opportunity to move throughout the system. And then our system is also designed in a way that it, it for bison to feel like every step as they move further into the system is the way out. Um, and that really helps them, helps encourage their movements through that system. Um, we've done some look at um, our stress levels in bison while they are being worked and um, what we kind of found was that older bison seem to be less stressed out. Um, maybe that's because they've had some level of experience with that working procedure. Um, we also found that it may actually um, be dictated by how or which bison or where the bison came from. So if they had a really stressful experience at their last facility, when they come to our facility, um, maybe our facility is a lot easier for them to work through. So maybe that um, that's a less stressful experience for them. But perhaps in other cases, uh, the bison's old facility was a very unstressful, or maybe they've never been worked at all. And that, um, that working time may increase their stress they may, be, may, they may exhibit increased stress compared to other bison during that working time. Um, we also looked at how stress works within the social hierarchy, um, uh, uh, in particular males versus females and how stress works within their hierarchy. And so what we found was that males exhibited what's called stress of dominance. So they're kind of constantly being challenged at the that kind of king on the mountain sort of uh, sort of role. They're kind of constantly being challenged from below. So those older males, those most high high ranking males, are are stressed out quite a bit. Now females, uh, we see kind of the flip side. We see what uh, they ex exhibit what's called stress of subordination. So that older female is kind of constantly exerting um, her dominance down the chain. And what we also found with that is that females tend, the high ranking females tend to decide the movements of the herd. So where the herd's going. Um, so some pretty interesting stuff we're starting to, to piece together. But then as we look at that um, on, as in a, in a breeding structure, we really start to see an image of high ranking males are a bit, are breeding 
um, high and mid-ranking females. Mid-ranking males are breeding mid to low-ranking females and low-ranking males are not getting a chance to breed. And so that becomes really important as we're really looking at this uh, genetic diversity standpoint that if a male stays on top and is a high-ranking male for quite a few years in a row, we're really not going to achieve some of our genetic diversity goals because those high-ranking males are the only ones breeding. Um, as I mentioned, we do some parasite testing um, as part of our health monitoring program. And one of the cool things that we found is that um, bison, as their new calves and yearlings, exhibit the highest levels of parasite loads. Um, and then that dramatically decreases as they kind of cross the two to three year old threshold. Um, and so they, by the time they're six to nine years old, so that about the time that bulls start to become dominant in the breeding system, they really have low levels of parasite counts. Um, we also looked at treatment and how effective treatment was. And essentially, parasite treatments had short-lived effects on our bison. Um, and we've never been able to um, measure any clinical sign or any measurable weight loss with bison that were untreated or bison that had higher parasite loads than others. And treatment essentially works against natural selection, not allowing bison to develop natural immunities over time. And so one of the things that we've done at the Crane Trust and learned from this is that maybe deworming and parasite treatments are unnecessary and um, that uh, maybe that, that the bison appear to be developing natural uh, immunities to these things over time, which makes sense. They would have had to be out in the landscape in a natural setting um, and had to have uh, contended with parasites in their system throughout their time. So really what we're really concerned about now is new parasites entering um, our herd. And again, that's where that biosecurity comes into play, um, making sure that we screen our new bison that we go to introduce um, before they get reintroduced to the rest of the population. So the last goal I'm going to kind of talk about is um, the Crane Trust goal to improve education and outreach efforts um, for the Crane Trust. And, um, you know, the Crane Trust is famous, of course, for sandhill crane migration and whooping cranes. And, you know, during the winter, we have a perfect ambassador for, and, and during the spring, we have a perfect ambassador for um, for the river, we have the, the sandhill cranes and the whooping cranes, and they speak for the river and they inspire conservation for the river. But what about the rest of the year? Um, bison now can serve as the Crane Trust Prairie Ambassador. So they are now the ones bringing interest into a landscape that's, um, you know, tall grass prairies over 97% um, lost throughout the Great Plains. And now we have somebody, to, or a species that speaks to conservation year round. Um, we have a small herd up at the Nature and Visitor Center that's easily accessible by folks to come and see, um, inspiring ecotourism and continued viewing of our wild areas. Uh, bison have been a great um, sourced for media production and for um, short media releases and then getting in contact with local news and newspapers to kind of, again, tell that Prairie Ambassador story. Um, they've been a great avenue for us to reach out to students and provide education opportunities, engagement, um, and even some undergraduate and graduate work has come out of our bison program. So really looking at that higher education level as well as local education. Um, we do do a lot of work um, kind of within the bison community platforms, places like American Bison Society, National Bison Association, and several others, um, in which we can not only share our research, um, but then also get a chance to learn from other people and um, their best practices with their bison. And then the last one is that we know how important bison are to um, the Great Plains, particular indigenous um, cultures. And, you know, we're just now starting to um, explore ways in which we can we can help the indigenous cause, whether it's food sovereignty or cultural relationships or um, ceremonial purposes, how we can connect with our indigenous partners and um, and help bring bison back to their landscape. 
So I guess in conclusion, we can use our bison to create these diverse landscapes, um, especially if we use them in combination with fire and get them to move around. Um, we really are starting to start, start to see the big landscape changes that are happening. But more importantly, small conservation oriented herds can contribute to the greater recovery effort of bison as a species. So we can contribute to that ecological recovery, we can contribute to their genetic recovery, and we have a say in what happens with their cultural recovery and to inspire more people to care about these bison. And these less defined herds are serving as the the leaders in research conservation. So whether or not they're identified strictly as a conservation herd or a production herd or somewhere in the middle, um, really they're they're the ones putting out a lot of the, the novel research, especially in bison in areas where bison are being reintroduced and not studied yet. Okay, I think that's all I've got for a presentation, and I am happy to um, answer some questions. Okay, so it looks like we have a few questions. Um, one is from sure. Pat. The first question is, what is your pasture load head pairs per acre? Okay, so um, right now we do a really conservative stocking rate. So we kind of go with the uh, take half, leave half uh, sort of theory, and we estimate our production tended to be about 4,000 pounds per acre. But with that take half, leave half, what we are um, taking, essentially we use half of that for drought mitigation. So really it's take a fourth. Um, so we're really looking at um, ab about uh, eight acres per animal is what we have, but we have them on rotation. Sometimes it's open gate rotation. Sometimes they're in one paddock. Sometimes they're in three or four at the same time. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, next question is from Peggy and she said, thank you for this very interesting program. You may have mentioned this already and I missed it, but how long is the gestation period in our most births, single births? How many births do you have each year? Thanks again. So gestation on a bison is like nine and a half months or so. Um, typically they will um, produce calves in May to June. However, sometimes we have a late bloomer um, or a late comer and we actually had one in the beginning of October this year, it was quite strange. Um, our most, most of them are single births. We've had a couple of occasions of calves, uh, of twin calves. Um, usually in those occasions, we've wound up actually having to bottle feed um, at least two bison, um, which has been exciting and fun at the same time. Um, and then how many births do we have a year? So right now with uh, the number of essentially breedable females, um, we could have somewhere between 40 and 55 uh, calves per year, um, but our calving success rates um, just a, right about 82%. So of all the possible um, animals that could have calved that year, about 82%. And uh, usually, and this is kind of elaborating a little bit, but usually what we find is that, um, you know, first time calvers, so first time a mom might be trying to have a calf, that, that may be the only time she has complications in her calving cycle or, you know, through the several years where she may calve. Um, but typically, um, you know, we, we don't do any intervention with our with our bison calves and in, in the calving process. So again, they're they're a way more resilient uh, species as far as just getting through that birthing process than cattle are. Okay, and then our third question is from Robin, and they asked, "How large are male bison?" Um, so male bison can be um, typically anywhere between 2,000 and 2,600 pounds. 2,600 pounds would be a pretty big bison. Usually those would be corn-fed bison or corn-finished bison that would get that big. Okay, thank you. And then we have a few more coming in right now. Thank you guys. If you have more questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A and we will answer them or Josh will answer them. I won't answer any questions today. Um, how often do you run your bison through your shoot system? Um, we do that once a year. Um, we're actually getting close to about the time of year that we do it. We usually do it 
beginning of winter sometimes so the you know it's nice and cool for them and it, that helps with the stress factor to keep them nice and cool um, so we only use we only do that about once a year so okay and then pat is wondering do you do natural breeding or do you do ai yeah everything we do here is natural so again kind of looking at natural selection as a driver um, and then offering you know as many bulls of breeding age as we can so that, um, you know, we get a, a good diverse mix of calf crop every year. So that's kind of our goal. Okay, and so far that is all the questions we have. Like I said before, if any of you guys have questions, feel free to drop them down below. Do we name the bison? Um, so we have, uh, as I mentioned, one of those bottle fed uh, calves. Uh, her name is Patty. Uh, she is named <laughs> um, because she's de near and dear to our heart and has now become sort of a mascot for us. Um, but uh, the other ones are not named. We have some pet names for a few of them. Um, one of them is like Goofy Horns and Afro. Um, when we first got the bison, we actually had an intern working on uh, kind of being the Jane Goodall of our bison, um, describing some of their uh, physical attributes. Um, they're again, kind of looking at that social hierarchy structure. And, uh, and at that time, when we only had about 46, 47 uh, bison, um, she had a name for everyone, but now we've just kind of grown too much, so. And then Amy asked, there's pictures of the cranes in the bison wallows. Could you tell us more about the crane's reaction to these changes? Yeah, um, so that was just kind of one of those incidental things that we had this idea of like, well, you know, how do we study, you know, whether or not cranes are using bison pastures. And um, I think the jury's still out on you know, the total effect that bison will have on cranes, but essentially they're creating the habitat types that cranes like to use. They're creating this diverse set from everything from short to tall grass, all within the same pasture. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen bison or cranes in bison pastures throughout their migration. Uh, the wallows, I think, is, you know, something we're really interested in continuing to explore. Um, not only cranes use of wallows, but all these other wildlife that crane may be actually eating on um, in these wallows. There's some historic accounts of whooping cranes actually waiting by these bison wallows for them to fill up with rainwater and then them eating frogs out of them. So haven't seen that yet. Um, maybe one day though. So. Okay. And real quick, before we go to the next question, we do have a feedback survey that I'm going to start here. If you guys can go ahead and complete that, this is how we maintain funding through our AmeriCorps program. So your response is really important to us. Um, so just take some time to answer those three questions and then we're going to continue with some of the Q&A. Have you culled the herd at all? What is the current size of the herd and what is the max load of your current land base? So we are at carrying capacity based upon our, um, our uh, stocking rate that we want. Um, that's usually about 115, 116 adult animals. So that's breeding age. Um, and then we have uh, last year's calves and this year's calves. So we don't, we don't uh, cull our bison as calves. We cull them as yearlings. So to answer that part of the question, yes, we do cull and we cull every year. Um, again, those culling events are geared towards yearling bison that have been with mom for at least 16 to 17 months. Um, and then they um, are geared towards going to places that are going to start new conservation herds. Um, and so our carrying capacity is right around 146, 147 um, with that stocking rate. So, and we are there. Okay. And then another question, do you have a favorite bison? <laughs> um, no. Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think, uh, honestly, it's kind of getting hard to, some of them, it's really hard to even tell them apart anymore if they didn't have tags on them. But, uh, 
Um, it's hard not to like Patty, even though she's probably put more than one dent and broken more than one taillight at the crane truss rubbing on our trucks, but it's really hard not to like her. How tall and what are the perimeter fencing structures? Um, so our fences are um, eight foot, seven to eight foot tall. Um, then we have, uh, they are six strands. So we have a smooth wire on the bottom, a double stranded wire, a smooth wire on top. Um, then we have uh, two strands of barbed wire in the middle and then a strand, uh, uh, two strands, um, second from the top and second from the bottom that are hot wire, uh, hot wire uh, high tensile fence. So they have a lot, uh, they don't stretch very much. They're really hard to break those type of fences. So. How often do the bison get exposed to humans? Do they get to use used to human interactions like cows? Um, yeah, I think that they do eventually with time get used to, you know, at least being comfortable doing their thing when humans are around. Um, the uh, her small herd up at the visitor center definitely gets a lot more people looking. Um, however, there's different times of the year where the bigger herd um, has as close to a public road and they get quite a few people that stop and look. Um, but, uh, you know, the South, the bigger herd doesn't get exposed to humans nearly as much, except for when people are going out to check on them. Um, we do offer some small bison tours um, that are related to different events throughout the year. Um, and those are kind of the main options for interaction there. So. Any idea on how far bison would move on a day-to-day -day basis if allowed to move freely on a fence less prairie? Um, so distance is gonna depend on water sources and again, on where those preferred areas of grazing are. Um, bison could probably move 15, 20 miles in a day if they um, you know, are just grazing and mosing along. Um, so, but it's really hard to tell. Again, we don't have a lot of um, a lot of areas to study that bison don't have fences. Even a lot of the national parks and places have areas of fence. Yellowstone's kind of the last you know place to the bison are able to freely move. And and even then, um, if they get outside the yellow, Yellowstone boundaries, the law is different with how you can handle bison on your property. So. Um, but they can move several miles in a day. And even within a fence structure, um, they'll move back and forth or between pastures um, quite a bit and even go back and forth a couple miles on the same day to, the, to two different favorite spots. Bison improving crane habitat, do you see anything that the cranes add that the bison benefit from? Um, I would say indirectly, um, the direct response, you know, cranes are only here for a short period of time, you know, in, in March, um, into April, and then, you know, maybe are here for a day or two in the fall migration. Um, but I would say, um, indirectly, uh, they, they benefited just by having this land, right? The 6,000 acres of protected land wouldn't even be in existence today if it weren't for you know, the conservation and love for cranes. So there would have been no place to restore bison in central Nebraska like we have um, without, you know, the, the momentum of crane conservation. And then we have another, the last question is, are visitors allowed and where is the range located? So um, visitors are allowed. Um, to view our bison again, the, the the small herd is up at the right right behind the Nature and Visitor Center, which is totally free to come to. Um, that's exit 305 off of Alda, um, at the Alda exit on Interstate 80. So actually, you can see those bison. Um, there's a, a, a gravel access road that runs right next to the bison pasture. Um, there's walking trails that that walk back behind um, the bison pasture, and then there's also you can also see them from the interstate. Um, and then the bigger herd, that's they're only accessible um, at uh, 
different times of the year depending on which pasture they're in so if they're at the one close to the highway then they're 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 easy to see um but yeah so that range is located the big range is located just south of the river across from the nature and visitor center so you can actually walk over to that bigger range even if you can't see the bison on a particular day Okay, and that looks like all the questions we have so far. Um, if anybody else wants to ask some questions, please feel free. Um, I want to thank you, Josh, for taking the time out of your day to be here. And I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, we've really enjoyed having you guys here today and being able to talk about bison and all that is bison. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm glad to be here. And um, my email uh, is jwc at cranetrust.org. You can find it on the website if you have any follow-up questions or um, need somebody to talk about bison um, to a, to another group or whatever you need. So I'm, I'm pretty accessible and happy to answer questions. Okay, we have a few more questions coming in. Um, what is normal adult age to call adults? Um, so we actually haven't wound up in that situation quite yet. Um, you know, we normal adult normal age would essentially be, you know, for from a production side would be when they ever, ever that animal stopped being, you know, productive, um, whether it's that the bull is no longer breeding or, um, you know, that that calf or that heifer is no longer producing calves. Um, so uh, we like I said, we really haven't got to that stage yet. We have had a couple bulls that are 15, 16 years old that are kind of on that end of just being too old to be competitive anymore. Um, and, but our females, we have some 15, 16 year old females that are still producing a calf every year, or every other year. So, um, you know, they're really not at that age where we're going to consider culling them quite yet. So, but I'd say a lot of people start to look at culling their bison from a producer standpoint at 13, 14, 15 years old, it'd be about too old for them to carry a bison. And then Virginia asks, do you think it's possible for bison to regain in numbers where they are roaming more than on your land? Ah, that's a good question. So that comes, you know, again, I, I kind of alluded to that Nebraska is largely privately owned and, um, what that would take is essentially a consortium or agreement or fellowship between several landowners that were adjacent to one another to kind of make that work. Um, you know, we have some other conservation organizations that have land adjacent to ours and we've kind of played around with the idea of maybe one day we could expand that range into their lands as well. Um, but again, it, you know, uh, especially in central Nebraska, land prices are just through the roof. It's prime ag, ag country. Um, but um, if we can, you know, work in partnership, eventually, I, I do hope that one day we'll kind of see a wider range um, for these for these bison to be able to move in this area. And then Pat says, thank you so much, Josh. Very informative and well presented. Thank you. And then we have another thank you enjoyed by Nikki and Dan Gregory, Fran and Dwayne Liston. Thank you, I'm glad to have you guys here. And so far that looks like all the questions we have. I think on that note, we will end things. Um, thank you guys again for coming and taking the time out of your evening to be here with Josh and I today. Thank you guys.